should get us to roughly the middle, which is right here, to the middle of the middle of the place. Hey folks, um, so yesterday was one of those uh, classic uh, non-professional do-it-yourselfer days where I probably spent more time staring off into space, contemplating life, the universe and everything than actually doing stuff. But we did, uh, you know, after many trips to the internet and, and, and just kind of making sure that I was keeping things straight, I uh, finished up the roughing for the toilet and the sink in the powder room. But on that, I just wanted to say, like, uh, you know, just preface this statement with, we are not a how-to channel, right? We don't claim to be, and, and it's probably, like I've said before, very evident in the content and, and what we show, uh, you know, in our progress and what we're doing. But um, one thing that I, I have learned um, is, is, you know, to take a bit of humility. And whenever I have an idea, so if I know the concepts around plumbing, like venting and yada yada, and I come up with a, an idea, the first thing I want to do is, poke around on the internet and find some diagrams that show someone having done something similar. And if I don't find it, then my spidey sense tingles and that tells me that I'm probably not doing it right. And so I had to go back and forth a few times because exactly that, I really didn't see the strategy that I was employing reflected in, the, in, the, in any of the documentation or any of the, the forums and that. So, so, you know, that was part of the many trips to the internet and kind of second guessing myself. So I ended up cutting some pipe and then having to recut it and, and other things. Didn't really waste any material, which always makes me happy. I hate, I hate wasting stuff, but that's also part of it too. Um, in the end, what, what I have is just a stack that drops down like, to be determined where we put the actual collar in that. I've left the top piece that connects. I've allowed that to swivel so that we can kind of reposition it that and bend it into place. But um, the, the drop down and the slope to the pipe, uh, the main sewer line, that's all square, that's all kosher and follows code. It's dropping the quarter inch a foot. And um, uh, the other thing that I did, and, and I can tell myself that it's okay, but it, you know what I mean? If I had a time machine, I wouldn't have done it exactly this way, but it's not the biggest deal. Is I completely forgot about the idea that we want to have a separate gray water system. And so in just thinking in ways of traditional plumbing, and again, because I have a tendency to wing it instead of kind of writing it down and playing it out first, I didn't realize until this morning, I said to Kim, oh man, I forgot that uh, that kitchen sink, or sorry, the, the sink in the powder room should be going to a separate line that's gonna go into our, our gray water filtration and banking system. And in the end, it's only the powder room sink, so like I say, I can delude myself and say, eh, it's not a big deal anyways, because it's a very small amount of water, washing your hands, occasionally using that bathroom. Um, that's going to go down into the, the field bed, but um, <laughs> remembered in time so that we know when we do the washer, when we do the sink, when we do the you know potential shower in the master bath separate from the tub, the tub, and the uh, wash sink in the bathroom. All those, you know, essentially the toilets are going down into the main sewer line and off they go, but everything else is going into the ground banking system. Um, so that is that for that, and then today Kim's going to be tackling the lawn, the ever uh, reoccurring chore of mowing this grass with all the rain that we've been getting, it grows pretty quick. And then I'm going to start assembling some beams, and then I'm going to switch some gears some more because we only have so many 2x12s, so we can build the north side of the, of the house, we can do the east side, and then when I have all that up, um, I'm planning on and although this isn't really a normal building practice, I just bought a relatively inexpensive roll of Rhino roof underlayment. It's a weather, uh, like a wind and, and water barrier. And I'm just simply gonna staple that over top of my beams. Cause again, it's just me and Kim doing this. 
So it's going to take us longer than, say, if a crew went at it, especially an experienced crew, like, like the, the one our son works for. Um, and so we know that the, the timber is going to be exposed to the elements for, you know, a fairly long time. And I've read that that's not really that big a deal, as long as it's not plywood and standing structures that are holding puddled water and are going to delaminate in that. Your framing can get the occasional dousing of water and snow without it really causing problems, you know, for as much as a couple of years. Um, but to try and minimize that, for instance, when we build our beams, I'll cover it with that rhino um, underlayment. That'll ensure that the water sheets off. Nothing's getting in between the plies. Because once we get into the cold weather, the last thing I want is warmer days where the water gets down in between the plies of the beams that we're going to build, the nailed lumber beams, and then having that freeze and expand and start driving them apart. So that's one thing, and then we'll kind of figure it out as we go. Because the idea is we're going to build our girders around the outside and through the center. We're going to put in our joists next, and all in that water and snow can just drop right in between. Then we're going to put up our walls, our roof. We're going to then sheave the roof. Then we're going to sheave the walls. Then we're going to sheave the floor. Because we're going to have a layer of plywood underneath and a layer of plywood over top. And I do not want that built before I have a roof and a structure and walls to keep driving snow and rain from puddling on top of that plywood. And that, I do know, will eventually soak in, start to cause delamination and warping and all kinds of things we don't want. So that's where we are today. I need it to kind of sit more flush. There. Last night it started to it was only 10% chance of rain but we it rained at the end of the day so I have to finish cutting the grass I only got about halfway done and Al is going to continue working on the beams so the idea is that we want to finish that back portion the north um, side and the east side he wants to finish that all the way down so uh, hopefully we can get that all done today it seems to be going along relatively quickly and we're pretty happy with uh, that first three beam stretch that he finished yesterday on the east side so um yeah it's getting exciting because you know the more and more that it goes up it gets a lot easier to actually picture where all the rooms are where everything's going to be and uh it just makes it easier for planning so uh 
yeah, we're going to be doing that today. It's supposed to be a beautiful day, so hopefully we don't have any worries about uh, getting rained out again and we can finish more than we did yesterday. doing here for those who have any interest <laughs> is uh, I need a little extra bearing edge although because my beam will sit back a bit um, it should be uh, the necessary inch and a half that I need for it to rest but just in case it isn't what I've done is I just pulled out my my six inch carriage bolt I'm going to use a 10 inch carriage bolt I'm just I, I just hollowed out some some space to accommodate for the two screws and the hardware because I don't want to remove the car saddle itself what I'm going to do is sit this on here, clamp it, drill through all the way to the other side. Then I'm going to put through that carriage bolt, bolt it into place. I'll slip a shim in between here just to space it properly. And then in addition to having that carriage bolt holding this, I'm going to put two four and a quarter inch spikes into the left and the right. Uh, well, I guess right and left. And that will hold this in place. It's going to rest on the edge of the concrete block. The, the carriage bolt will hold this tight to the post, which is secured to the to the uh, car saddle, and then the nails are just there for extra insurance. Um, and my understanding is just the carriage bolt itself, like the amount of shear force that it, that, that it contains, uh, sorry, that it um, provides, is is bananas. Like it would be one of the strongest components of this whole assembly from the footing up through. So that's what we're doing here, just essentially just creating some additional bearing edge because our beam is going to come up to here one half, and then another beam going there, there'll be a splice here, and then the connecting beam that runs across the entire width of the building is going to rest probably starting about an inch and a half here and then across this. So this is just some added insurance for SNGs.
So today Al is going to be working on uh, the layout for the roughing in of the rest of the plumbing and while he's doing that I am going to be oiling the bottom portion of our blue box just to make sure that uh, it stands the test of time. Around. Before the cup. Yeah. Yeah. Because you just want enough to be able to get like shampoo, soap, like, no, right. you know what I mean? So then you add a foot to the regular dimension. Saying the average cup is 32 inches, add 12 inches to that, that's 44 inches. Yeah. So that puts our tub ending. And that's with a surround all the way around it. And if the average tub is about five feet long, and we're adding another foot to that, we can still less than this. Yeah. But we'll leave that. the corn Don't scare you too 